And thank you all for coming. Um, I, I, was, I was worried because I didn't think anybody would be interested in uh, air travel on United Airlines and Aspen. Um, <laughs> uh, just a show of hands, people who have flown to Aspen, how many uh, flew United? I, I guess I should raise my hand too. Wow, okay. Um, thank you. How many, I mean, it didn't look like there were that many hands that weren't up, but how many have flown United in the last month? How many haven't flown United in the last month? Okay, like seven. <laughs> how many have 100,000 miles or more on United Airlines? How many are global services? Okay. All right, well, that gives a window. There's some interest here. Um, so, Jeff, I guess my first question is, how can I become global services? <laughs> Depends on how this interview goes. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I've heard um, and watched interviews with you uh, in the past, and uh, it just seems like sometimes interviewers, they're selfish and they take advantage of the opportunity to ask you, you know, really personal travel planning questions. Um, and I am not going to do that at all. I thought you were about to say you're not going to break that mold. <laughs> right. Um, well, let me break the mold for just one second. The thing that really bothers me uh, when I've been traveling recently it's, it's the bags that you bring up to the gate when you're getting ready to board, and you, you, you know, you're, you're a business traveler, you're carrying on your bags, you plan to carry on, you don't want to go to baggage claim when you get somewhere, and they tell you that you have to check your bag right at the gate before you board because there's no room left in the overhead bins on the plane, and you do it because you're told to do that, and you get on the darn plane, and there's just endless empty space in the overhead bins. Is, is there like a financial reason for the airline that they have to stop me from putting my bag in the overhead bin? Is no, there something strange no, going on? No, we, you know, we've somewhat created this monster ourselves um, as we've broken apart the ticket in, and unbundled it. Um, we've begun charging for check bags for certain of our passengers, not our premier passengers, certainly not global services, uh, uh, not folks in, in, certain, uh, in certain classes of, of service. But for economy, we have a number of passengers for whom we charge to check a bag because that's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of fuel burn, it's a lot of expense, and the other passengers were cross-subsidizing when it was built into the ticket. Those who weren't checking a bag were cross-subsidizing the passengers who were checking the bag. I love that you're taking my question seriously, by yeah, the way. No, I was it, really, it, I, no, it, I really it's appreciate serious, it. But it is an issue. Um, we try to, and we, we do get the, the bins packed full. In fact, we've invested in larger bins, bins where you can, where you can stack your bag vertically um, so that you can fit more on, um, because we, we know most passengers want to bring their bags on board. It's more convenient. Um, but there's only you know, so many cubic feet of space when you've got more cubic feet of bags and cubic feet of space. That forces us to ask uh, some of our customers to check the bags at the gate, even though they would prefer to carry them on. Um, generally, that's not, uh, you know, those are not our, our uh, uh, the passengers who are paying the most for the ticket or the who flies the most, but it certainly is, is a difficult issue and one that we haven't been able to solve yet. Uh, and there are, there are some solutions that we have kicked around internally that I'm not really prepared to talk about publicly, uh, but uh, uh, some of them would be more controversial than others, let's put it that way. Making some passengers ride in the, in the overhead <laughs> bins, or what is the... But, but, uh, but, it, is, but it is an issue, um, certainly, you know, we board by group. We board group group one through group five, and if you're in group five, which typically would be the lowest price ticket for the elite, for the passenger who travels us, the the you know less frequently, um, there's a higher probability that you're going to be the one who has to check a bag. If you're in group one or group two, you won't check a bag. Uh, it's very exceedingly unlikely you'd have to check a bag. This is a big reveal to me, actually. I, I thought th those boarding groups were still based on sort of the efficiency of boarding. And if you were a window, you might go in earlier. If you were on the aisle, you might go in later. But it actually is sort of the, the cost of the ticket and how much you're paying. It, it is, it is, it is a, we, we found, we've experimented with many forms of boarding, and there's no perfect form of boarding. Um, but we've experimented many forms. We've found this to be both efficient and also strides our customers by value. I want to ask you about a, a couple of sort of the big news items uh, in the industry right now. Um, and, and one is a, a topic that, that I know <coughs> passengers care deeply about, and that's air traffic controllers. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I remember when United allowed you to listen into the cockpit, um, hearing things that were very cool, hearing things that were very scary, um, like uh, a pilot who was coming into Reagan National Airport for the first time and was asking 
for advice on how to make that bank from air traffic controllers, which I was sort of like, I, I really hope my United plane is now off the runway and nowhere near that plane. Um, but it, it really does feel like our lives are in the hands of those air traffic controllers um, watching the radar and preventing horrible things from happening. Uh, many lawmakers, um, certainly the airlines, including yourself, now pushing for what sounds like privatized or semi-privatized air traffic control, taking it out of the FAA completely. Mm -hmm. um, explain the argument for that, if you can. Sure. Um, first of all, the, the, the controllers are very professional men and women. Uh, they do a superb job using the very finest World War II era ground-based radar technology. <laughs> and that, that is, in here, that is the, the, the issue that we have. Our, that's not an exaggeration. I mean, that's not an exaggeration. Our traffic control system is very safe, uh, but it is very inefficient. And um, the problem that we're solving for is that inefficiency. The air traffic control delays, the times that you're held um, either at the gate or on the runway because of ATC delays. Um, the the um, miles and trail, the distance that airplanes have to fly because of the system, uh, so that the so that it's more inefficient. The time that you'll sometimes fly in an airport and have to circle around waiting to land. Well, think of not only your time, but think of the fuel burned and think of the damage to the environment of the excess fuel being burned on the ground or in the air from a, from an ancient, very inefficient air traffic control system. There are something like 50 countries around the world that have separated the air traffic control system from the safety regulator. In fact, ICAO, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization of the United Nations, guidelines require that that be separated. And today in the United States, our, our FAA both regulates the system that it operates, and that's a huge conflict of interest. So what we have been working with um, the House uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and, uh, and the Senate Commerce Committee is on a bill that would separate out the air traffic control system from the FAA. And the bill that the, that the TNI uh, committee um, has crafted would put the, uh, the air traffic control system into a federally chartered, federally chartered nonprofit uh, entity. Similar to the, post, the Postal Service, right? Um, Something like uh, that? Uh, uh, I hope not. OK. Um, <laughs> uh, this would be actually free of governmental interference, although it would have, it would have representatives from, the, from the, the Department of Transportation. It would, have, it would have representatives, although not employees of or affiliated with uh, the airlines, but it would have people nominated by, for example, the Airlines for America, which is our trade association, which I chair. Um, uh, it would have representatives from NATCA, the Air Traffic Controllers Union. Uh, it would have a representatives from General Aviation, the users of the system. And what, what, a, what a, a separated uh, uh, air traffic control system would, it would charge user fees. This would be fees that would be charged to the airlines uh, based on the distance flown and the, and the weight and size of the airplane because a bigger airplane takes more airspace. Um, just like this is done, for example, in Canada. Canada has a very modern and efficient system called Nav Canada, which is in a separate not-for-profit enterprise. And they have more modern technology. Much more modern. No, NAV Canada's technology is vastly superior. Not only is it vastly superior to that in the United States, but the air traffic controllers union and the, and the employees are much more satisfied because they actually have greater input into the development and the effectuation of new technology. Uh, and they're, they're present at birth, and they're present uh, forming it, and they're present in the implementation. And they're very satisfied, and they're very productive, and it's a very safe system. And it's a much more effective uh, system and a much more efficient system in the United States. Through the user fee system, which would be transparent, so you'd see on your ticket, I mean, the way it would work is you'd have a ticket and instead of 17 different taxes and fees, which you pay today, be 18. equaling 21% of, of the price of a ticket today. So if you think about it, that's like for a family of four, there's a fifth invisible passenger called the US government taxes traveling with you. Um, there would be a, a simplified tax structure for the remainder of the FAA for purposes of safety regulation, things like that. But the rest of the, the, rest of the tax and fees would be collapsed into a user fee. So you'd have a ticket. It would be, it would be the cost of your ticket plus your ATC system charges. You see that in Canada. When you fly in Canada, you see on your ticket the NAV Canada um, over, you know, the, the flight. Uh, would this uh, reduce the burden on, on passengers? Slightly ultimately, passengers? it should because it, was, it's, it should become much more efficient. Air, NAV Canada has been able to reduce... Uh, the fee structure, I think, about 30% since it started. So it's become much more efficient, which would, re which would ultimately lower the, the prices to the consumer. Immediately, or would passengers see some new well, fee it would take, it would take It would take some time to modernize, because what this would do, these user fees would produce a steady stream of revenue, which could be bonded, and then that, 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 
you know, the, the um, uh, funds from, from the bonds are, uh, would, would be able to be put into modern infrastructure and develop modern, could have a, you could have a professional management team uh, that was incentivized to, um, uh, to modernize the technology, to involve NATCA in you know, the Air Traffic Controllers Union and their, and their employees in doing so. Um, NAP, look, this is, this, is, this is not reinventing the wheel. This has been done across the globe. It's been done very effectively. It's been done to our north, to the north. I even suggest maybe NAFCAN should just buy the system and just run it. So how did we get here? How did the FAA let us still be relying yeah. on World War II air technology? You know, it, it's, it's really, it's not FAA's fault. I mean, they, you know, the Michael Huerta and his team are good people. They work hard, but they've been subject to a lot of political interference on again, off again, uh, authorization of funding. I think the last FA bill went through something 20 some odd extensions, short term extensions. Uh, they went through the sequester, they had to furlough air traffic controllers. I mean, it's been, it's been a typical government mess. And the air traffic control system, in our judgment, and the industry's judgment, is far too important to the economy of, of this country. And to all of you as passengers and the inefficiencies that it drives to you and the cost it drives to us, uh, to, be continue, to be continued uh, oversight by the FAA. It needs to be more professionally managed with a better revenue stream uh, and the ability to modernize it as has been done uh, you know, across the globe. Some lawmakers who are concerned about this transition and potentially the cost of the transition have suggested that the airlines might pay higher fees to fund the transitional period. Um, I mean, that, that's, not, I, that, that's that? not the intent because uh, nor in the TNI bill is that the intent. Um, our position is we pay, we, we, we and you together pay about 21% of, of, your, of your ticket is a, is a, is a tax. Uh, we've agreed to pay the same amount. That is, we're not looking for a tax reduction. We believe that the system, a modernized, um, nonprofit governed system, uh, will drive enormous efficiencies, which ultimately will inure to our benefit and the benefit of passengers. Um, we're not looking for a tax increase. We're, we're heavily taxed. You know, heavily regulated industry. We don't need more taxes on this industry. Well, no one's looking uh, for a yeah, tax increase. But, but I think that, that. But I think there's there's more than adequate funding through the user fee system, and the residual taxes we would pay into the FAA for the operation of the FAA for its safety regulation, for example. You're not concerned about the transitional costs, as, as well. Right? I think that I, I I believe that the there will be plenty of money uh, that will be um, generated through user fees that will permit the FAA. Uh, to, I mean, the, the new entity to modernize the system. And, and, and it will, look, this is going to be a multi-year transition. This, it took, it took uh, NAV Canada many years to work through this, but it's, we have to start. We have to start somewhere, and I think this is the time to start because we're falling further and further behind as a nation in our air traffic control system, and it's becoming... My, look, I'll give you an example. When I first started in this business, we would schedule a trip from New York City to Washington in under an hour. We schedule that same trip in today, uh, anywhere from an hour and 15 to an hour and 30, right? So up to 50% more. And I know the continents, of, I mean, the cities haven't drifted apart. There's not been that, right? We it's the same it distance. Happens. And, and uh, because and we've, we've extended the schedule time because the system is so inefficient. There's so much delay that we know if we publish a time of a 55-minute of a, of a, of a, of a, of a flight, our passengers would be really ticked off because we're never going to make it in 55 minutes. And a lot of that is this old technology. I it mean, is the entirely old technology. Yeah. Let me ask you about another another big topic, and that's open skies. Both of us? Did Both of us? OK. Is that a little better? Um, no, no, thank you for pointing it out. Um, Open skies, uh, mm -hmm. a policy that um, allows air carriers from more than 100 countries uh, access to the US market coming in. Um, the legacy airlines in the United States have had major, major complaints about some of the Persian Gulf states, uh, suggesting that a few airlines are heavily subsidized to a point where um, it's just a competitive disadvantage for the US airlines. Mm -hmm. um, some say that these are airlines like United uh, basically complaining about you know, just a competitive market. Make the argument that this is a real problem for an airline like United. Well, I think it is a real problem. You know, the, the U.S. has a, a long history of open skies agreements. These are bilateral treaties that permit carriers to pretty much fly uh, from one nation to another anywhere they want with any level of frequency. And we're a huge supporter of open skies. We've been a huge at United Airlines. And our industry, the U.S. industry, has been a huge beneficiary of open skies. It's permitted us to fly around the globe. We fly to, you know, 370 destinations, 5,000 flights a day. This has been a home run. Um, each of those agreements is premised, 
however, on a, on a competitive playing field free of government distortion. And the Gulf, the two treaties that we're, that we are, that we're at issue with today, which are the treaties between the United Arab Emirates and, the, and, 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 and also Qatar and the United States, um, under those treaties, they've been terribly abused because the, the, two, the three carriers of the, the two in the UAE and, and Qatar um, have received over $42 billion of government subsidies over the past 10 years, plus a lot of other stuff we haven't been able to quantify because they're interested party transactions uh, where we, we're not able, uh, through their fairly opaque financial statements, to understand um, the degree of, the, of that subsidization. Um, the, the, you, and this isn't really a, about state-owned enterprises because there are other airlines that are state-owned enterprises, but these carriers, Etihad and, 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 and Qatar and Emirates, are aberrational in the sense that they are growing. Let, let me explain. The demand for air travel grows roughly with gross domestic product. So if gross domestic product grows by 2%, the demand for air travel grows by 2%. Um, these three carriers have been growing at almost four times world gross domestic product growth. Uh, and they have, they have, for example, in the, in, in, in the past few years, they've added 11,000 seats to the United States, 11,000 seats a day, while stimulating less than 100 new passengers. 100. So where are the other 10,900 passengers coming from? They're coming from U.S. carriers and our partners. And they're, and they're effectively dumping capacity because it's subsidized. It's either subsidized capacity or subsidized product. Etihad is, is offering a three-room suite with a butler, okay? Now, why does, not, why does United not do that? It's a good question, Jeff. Be, well, the, the, reason is, <laughs> the, the reason is no one will pay for it. That's a subsidized product. This is a trade dispute. This is not an open skies dispute. This is not protection. This is a plain vanilla trade dispute. No, no different than subsidized steel, subsidized strawberries, subsidized soybeans. No different. They're, these are subsidized airline seats. But to re respond if you can. The, the, the CEO of Emirates came out and, mm -hmm. and offered a very strong rebuttal to many of the arguments that you and the other airlines in the United States have, have, have made. Um, and one of them is it gets to the very point you're making, basically arguing that that the WTO, you know, as subsidies are defined, um, that policy doesn't even involve the airline industry. It excludes it. And so, you know, the, and I don't want to get in a, a tit for tat, but I mean, the argument from, from him was, one of them was that A, there's, there's just no precedent for defining this as a subsidy that would be covered by the WTO as, as a trade dispute. And then he goes on to say that even if there were law applying to this, that, that the airlines like United have not made a compelling case that, that you're at a disadvantage. I I mean, will, is, I will, is, your, is your case that firm? If I, will, I will agree with him and disagree with him. This okay. is clearly not governed by the WTO. If it were, this would be a, a slam dunk perfect certain trade case. This trade case involves matters in dispute that are about twice the size of the Boeing Airbus dispute. So this is a material trade dispute. I mean, it's not governed by WTO. If it were governed by WTO, I'd be, I'd be one happy camper because we'd be, we'd be killing them. Uh, the problem is it's not government, so we are subject to the bilateral treaties, the two bilateral treaties. And what we've asked our government to do, the treaties provide for consultations. That's merely sitting down and saying, look, these treaties were premised on fair competition free of government distortions like the massive subsidies that you've received. Let's talk nation to nation about what this means to the U.S. industry and its effect on jobs here, and let's talk about the level of capacity that you're dumping into the United States just as if it were a, a normal WTO trade dispute. So um, uh, he's correct that this is not under WTO. We've never claimed it was under WTO. What we've done is we've taken a look at the subsidies as if it were under WTO, because that's an internationally accepted standard of what a subsidy is, and we valued them in accordance with the Department of Commerce valuation. So we've been very pure and very careful in our determination of the quantity and valuation of the subsidies admitting that there are, we believe, vast additional subsidies we can't get our hands on because they're interested party transactions. If you take, exa uh, for example, Dubai, Dubai or, or Mr. Clark's uh, airline, um, you know, let me give you what it would be like in the United States if, if this were Dubai. I would be the CEO of every airline in the United States. I would also run the FAA. I would also run the central bank. I would also run the, the ground handling group, the monopoly ground handler. You sound really I, I excited would, about this. I would also run every airport in the United States. That is what Dubai is today. 
it's good to be the king. There's no question about it. Um, but, but there's massive amounts of subsidies that we have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. And they're very unhappy with the fact that we've exposed this level of subsidy. And, and their model, their competitive model, is threatened because they, they rely on subsidization. But you're in a tough spot because there's no sort of established legal precedent. I mean, you're, you're basically asking the Obama administration to do something that, that would be very new. There is not a precedent because the United States has not disputed any of its Open Skies treaties. This would be the first time it has. If there's any Open Skies treaty that should be disputed, it's these two Open Skies treaties, because they're being heavily abused. Are you worried that you're not going to be able to make a, a case? And well, We've made a very strong case. I'm not worried about our case. Uh, there are, of course, always political concerns, and what they call in Washington countervailing considerations, which I believe are those sorts of sort of darker defense things that I will never know about. Um, but uh, we, I think we've made a compelling case to our government, and we, and we are not going away, uh, and we expect our government to act, and, and to act in, as it would in any other, uh, any other significant dumping case, because it's been the long-established policy of the United States government in trade disputes to not permit dumping. That is antithetical to our trade policy, antithetical to, in the long term, to jobs, uh, antithetical to everything this nation stands for in open and fair competition. And what is dumping, just for people who... who dumping is basically, is basically taking a product, subsidizing it, and, and selling it at a subsidized price. I mean, in the short run, consumers love it. Everybody loves cheap strawberries. I mean, you get a quart of strawberries for 59 cents. But the reality is, in the long run, that destroys industry in the United States, destroys jobs in the United States, destroys the United States, ultimately, its competitiveness, uh, damages the economy. Uh, damages the, the enterprises that are having to compete. I mean, we are willing to compete at United Airlines against any carrier in the globe, and we do it every day. What we can't compete against is the treasury of another nation, right? Whenever Qatar needs more money, they just, like, open the valve and it spurts out. Well, there's no way for us to effectively compete against the treasury of a nation. I want to ask you a, a bit more about customer service, my, my own baggage complaints aside, but on, on a broader level. Um, <laughs> Uh, United is very profitable right now. Uh, the, the airlines are, are doing much better. Uh, this year's American Customer Satisfaction Index comes out. United scores a 60 out of 100. It was the same as the year before. The Wall Street Journal uh, pointed out that United got out of the basement only because Spirit and Frontier were included this year for the first time. Why aren't you satisfying your customers? Well, we're not happy with where we are, but what we are able to do now that we are profitable is make the right level of investments that we've not been able to make historically. Because historically, our idea of long-range planning was could we make it through the winter? Uh, now that we are, are consistently profitable and we're actually generating free cash flow, we're able to plow that back. We're plowing it back into our people in training. Uh, we're plowing it back into, into our fleet, into um, a more modern and reliable fleet, into our facilities. Uh, we have new terminals uh, that, we, that we've in, 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 in Heathrow, the Queens Terminal, uh, in Houston, in Boston, a uh, uh, new boarding area in San Francisco. Uh, we continue to modernize um, our, our, our um, onboard product. Uh, we're able to plow things back into customer-pleasing things like better food, better food in our clubs. We're modernizing our clubs across the system, healthy food in our clubs, better food up front on the airplane. Internationally, we've introduced all new food in the back, free beer, free wine, free bottle of water, uh, good, healthy food as well. Um, all the things that customers want. Um, and, you know, we didn't make these investments in the past because we were stupid. We didn't make them because we were poor. And so are these numbers just sort of... You know, I mean, the, and it, the lack of investment sort of still yeah. flagging? And well, it, it, it does. It takes time. Look, it takes time to turn around an organization where there's been a lot of underinvestment. And the old United, candidly, having gone through bankruptcy, uh, had underinvested a lot. Um, and it has been a, it's been a difficult journey. But we're making the investments in our people, in our technology, in our fleet, in our facilities, in our product. Um, and we, we realize that we need to improve the quality and consistency of our service. We've hired a, a firm, the same firm that, that goes around the world and rates um, hotels, the star system, right? We've hired the this, this same firm uh, to go around our system and be mystery shoppers on our system and gather 
um, data on how we're doing. So we know where we're doing well and where we're doing poorly, so we can focus our investment and our training where we're not doing as well, so we can pr improve the consistency. What stunned you when you saw something where you were just like, "That's we're doing that really well? Well, I mean, I'll give you a, a simple example. Uh, you go into any hotel, and if you're a, 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 if you're a, a, a member of their loyalty program, they will say to you, uh, Mr. Green, uh, thank you very much for being a, a, for being a, a, a goal level at Marriott, right? Thank you for being goal. Um, our customer service agents don't do that. They should. They have the information. They don't, right? This is a pretty simple thing, but that's just a matter of training and reinforcement. It's just they're, they're, they're a system of little things, but the, what's important to, to the customer is you can take a beautiful 787 Dreamliner, brand new airplane, and it can be on time and it, everything can work and you love everything about the airplane. But if you've got a gate agent who wasn't helpful, or if you've got a flight attendant who was surly, it ruins the flight for you because flight, flying's an experience. Now let's contrast it. You can have an older airplane and you can have, um, and it could even be delayed, an air traffic control delay, and you're unhappy because you're trying to make a connection, or you're trying to go home to your spouse, you're trying to make a wedding. But the friendliest flight attendant saying, Mr. Green, let me get you a Bloody Mary, good, for you, good you're here. Absolutely, that, that makes a difference. And for example, we, we're now outfitting, 20, our, we have 22,000 flight attendants. Um, this summer, um, and we've already started, and it takes a while to distribute these because there's 22,000 of them, um, um, every one of our flight attendants will have an iPhone 6 Plus. And with that iPhone, and this is not, this takes time because we're, as we develop the apps, we'll get so much better information. We invested in Wi-Fi. We invested in satellite-based Wi-Fi. Why did we do that? Well, one, customers wanted, and we're a global airline, so we needed to be available wherever you are. But really, it was the backbone for us as a business to be able to communicate back and forth in flight to our flight attendants, to our pilots, and to our customers. But it, and with this iPhone, we'll be able to determine in the future that Mr. Gr we know, Mr. Green, we, you, know, you missed your flight because the flight was late and we had to put you on this flight and you're unhappy. And wouldn't it be nice if we could identify you in flight and say, I, Mr. Green, I really apologize that we're late. Here, and by the way, I know your favorite drink is a double scotch. Here's your double scotch. You know me. And by the way, I'm, and by the way I'm, I'm going to hit this button and you're going to get an e-certificate for a free club visit or for a $50 off your next purchase or whatever and deliver it to you right then and right there. Right? I'm totally holding you that's to this. That's the future. Well, that's the future no, no, where no, we want to go, but, and, that's, and that's the kind of investments we're making. It's not here today, but, but, but we're, but we're, we're going to get there. But Jeff, let me just ask you, I mean, it's, it's one thing for customers to be patient, but when they see numbers like this and they see some of the other airlines who've been able to move faster and start to see their customer service numbers going up, what, why hasn't United been able to do the same at the same pace? Well, it's, it's, been, it's been frustrating uh, to me and to a number of people at the company, but recognize that the old United went through some pretty... <clears throat> tough and very difficult times. And there were a lot of people who were very unhappy, and some of whom um, I would argue uh, felt and, and perhaps were not fairly treated. And sometimes it's hard for those folks to let go. And you have to, over time, earn their trust, and you have to not just talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk and make their lives better. And we are doing that, but it does take time for these people um, to, to either reform or cycle out. I mean, for example, we, we, had, some, we had some folks uh, who, uh, who, who you know, were not, who had been at the company a long time and weren't particularly happy about changing. We were able to actually enter into an early out and have them leave the company. We gave them a payment, they left the company and hired in new people who were more enthusiastic. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a common thing. But it does take time. I, I, I will tell you that um, I believe, and certainly from, from the experience of, of many of our customers, I think that our service is improving. It is not where it needs to be, but we are absolutely committed to getting it there. And importantly, uh, we're investing in our employees to help them get there. It sounds like the merger, I mean, you're still dealing with sort of the, the after effects. And um, you know, th there are customers who remember the old Continental, I mean, you were CEO, and feel like there was much better customer service. And, and the merger has sort of brought that down. I mean, is, is, that, is that an accurate picture I, I, for I would some say customers that, to have? I, I would say that the, the merger was difficult on people. It's a hard thing and a lot with lots of changes. Um, and uh, post-merger, there was a degradation in service. Uh, the merger is largely behind us. That's not really a legitimate, quote, excuse for our people anymore. Um, we have a couple of open contracts, still joint, joint contracts, but what, of the 30 contracts we had to get done, we've done 28 of them. These are, collect these are collective bargaining agreements for unionized work groups. Um, 
So, you know, I, I believe there really isn't an excuse anymore other than we just need to continue to invest in our people, reward them uh, for doing a good job, um, and hold them accountable when they're not. And one of the issues historically that the old United didn't do ad adequately, I believe, is hold people accountable when they didn't do a good job, and we, and we should be able to do that, and we are doing that. Bother you that JetBlue is the number one airline in customer <laughs> service, and, and you just... You know, you, you, you're not even close to them right now in that, in that Well, survey. of course it bothers me. We would like to be viewed as the carrier of choice. We want to be viewed as an as a, as a, 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 a airline that's focused on customer service. Uh, and we will get there. It'll it takes more time, but we will get there. It, does it bother me? Of course. I want to be the best in customer service. Uh, that's our goal. Uh, and, we, and we're committed to it. We're spending a lot of money on it, and we're, and we're certainly working with our people to get there. I believe we'll get there. But it, it, look, these things, these things, unfortunately, take quite a bit of time. Let me ask you, and start thinking of your questions, because I'm going to turn to you in the audience in, in a minute. But you, you say you're spending a lot of money on customer service. Um, I think there's a perception, fair or not, that this is a moment when Fuel prices have gone down. The, the airlines, United included, I mean, United making you know, more money than most, if not all, other airlines in the world. Um, it's a time when customers should see fares being reduced. It's a time when they should see customer service improved noticeably. Um, and the perception is that because of sort of the less competition and the mergers and not having to compete for routes, that Airlines like United don't have to, to sort of pass on those savings to customers. They're able to just, you know, rake in money for shareholders. Well, well, pricing is going to be a matter of the demand for air travel in the various categories of travel that we have, various inventory buckets and, and, and supply, right? Um, we are committed at United to growing our carrier um, at or below gross domestic product. So basically, roughly the level of demand. We don't want to exceed the level of demand because that degrades our pricing and degrades our yields uh, and, and ultimately uh, degrades our profitability. Um, we also don't want to not grow, um, and United for too long shrank, um, because what you end up doing is seeding um, passengers to other carriers. Um, you know, the lower fuel prices have been beneficial for uh, airlines. There's also been demand degradation from lower fuel prices. We have a hub in Houston, Texas, for example. Uh, and certainly um, oil companies and oilfield services businesses and bankers and lawyers and accountants and consultants and all those people that service them, uh, demand for travel has dropped off. In the U.S. economy, the GDP projections for the U.S. economy, I think, have been marked down maybe three times already this year. Um, so, there's a, so there's a certain attenuation of demand that comes on the, on the headwind side of lower fuel prices. But lower fuel, fuel prices have been good for us, it, but again, it's permitted us uh, to make the kinds of investments, and a lot of it is catch-up investments. I'll give you an example. I don't mean investments in catch-up the condom, I mean catch-up investments. Um, Ketchup's going to be great. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I uh, uh, but I'll give you an example. At the old United, the ground service equipment, you know those, those tugs you see in all, that, they, the old United uh, pre-merger had that on a 100-year replacement cycle. Okay? Let me tell you, a tug doesn't last 100 years. <laughs> Again, it wasn't because the prior management was stupid. They weren't. They were, they were capable folks. It's just they didn't have any money. They were poor. Um, now we've put that back on an appropriate uh, uh, cycle, and we're buying a lot of ground service equipment, which means the ground service equipment doesn't crap out as much, which means there's fewer delays, right? So uh, uh, you know, we're investing a lot to catch up to where we should have been. We're investing a lot in the product. Um, uh, you know, we need to be profitable. You want us to be profitable because without being profitable, we cannot invest in the level of service uh, and the product itself and the, and, and, and the destinations and the United Clubs and the, and, and, and the technology and the fleet and all the things that we need to do. Um, so I think that, that, that we, you want us to be profitable. We, this is a business that hadn't even earned its cost of capital since the Wright brothers. Uh, and it's about time that we are profitable and, and, and we also, are taking the opportunity to deleverage ourselves. We're, we have way too much debt, even today. Uh, once George Parker used to be on the old Continental Board where I was the where I where I where I used to work, and George was a professor of finance at Stanford Business School. And at George's uh, retirement dinner, when we left the board, he stood up and said, "You know, I'm a professor of finance at Stanford Business School for you know 43 years or however long I've been, and I thought I knew a lot about leverage, but I didn't know anything about breathtaking leverage till I got in the airline business." Well, you don't also want us to have breathtaking leverage because you want us to survive the ups and the downs. You don't want a serial bankruptcy, the lack of an investment, the employee uh, disaffection, the degradation of service that comes in a bankruptcy. You don't, don't want that as Don't you also have shareholders who are sort of like, Jeff, it's, it's time for us to sort of Absolutely. Feel, so not only, you know, not only, 
not only are we reducing leverage and paying down our debt and getting to a level of debt where we're confident in a recession that we will survive, um, but it's about time that we paid some money back to our shareholders. We used to be the world's best destroyers of capital. We were really good at taking other people's money and burning it, and then turning back and saying, can I have some more? Well, you know, you can't, you can't continue that. And it's about time that we're paying back our shareholders a bit. Um, they've obviously, uh, you know, uh, benefited from, the, from a significant increase in the share value, uh, but we're, we're buying back stock today. Um, and we'll continue to do that uh, until we get to a level where we think that the stock is appropriately valued, in which case we'll switch to a dividend. Because we should, we, everybody should benefit. Consumers should benefit, our employees should benefit, the communities we serve should benefit, and our shareholders should benefit. Do you blame, blame consumers for having the perception I just mentioned and feeling like they're not yet benefiting? No, I don't blame consumers for anything. I mean, consumers uh, uh, pay good coin for travel. Um, they, should receive, they should receive a reliable product. They should, we should get you from point A to point B reliably with your underwear. That's what you pay us to do, right? Uh, that, we last, don't, that last part is very important. We don't always do that, and, and we need to strive to do that better. We should be better next year than we were this year and the better the year after. Uh, we should also, the things that you value and you're willing to pay for, we should provide, right? Wi-Fi. You wanted Wi-Fi. We got Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is really expensive on an airplane. It's, this is not Starbucks Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, we, we've invested, uh, you know, north of a quarter of a billion dollars just installing Wi-Fi on our fleet. Um, and the reason that Wi-Fi isn't free is because it's incredibly expensive. Uh, and we need to try to recover some of that cost. Uh, but, but I don't blame consumers. We, we need to be responsive to consumers. You're the ones who sign our paychecks. We need to listen to you. And what we have found is what consumers want more and more is control over their travel experience, particularly business consumers. And United is, is a business-oriented airline. And we love all of our customers, but the business travelers are who we really focus on the most. And they want control, which means investments, continued investments in technology. Our app, 20 million users of our app. And if you're not using the United app and you're flying United, you need to get the app because it's terrific. And the level of control that we're giving the customers through our app is growing every year. Um, the ability to reaccommodate yourselves as opposed to standing in line. If there's an irregular operation, there's a thunderstorm or maintenance causes an, air, an airplane to crap out, right? Um, that's a technical term in the airline business. Um, <laughs> you, we, you don't want to stand in line. You don't want us to tell you what flight to take. You want to be able to select it yourself. We need to do a better job for you doing that. So we know where we're deficient. But every one of those items that we know we're deficient, we are focused on, we're investing in, and we're knocking them off one by one by one. But when you've got an airline of our size, we have $100 million a day in revenue. We operate across the globe. There's not a second of any day where there isn't a United Airlines plane in the air. Um, with a very complex system, and very complex, uh, particularly complex legacy technology systems, uh, this takes time and focus and attention. And, and what you can't do is make a mistake that affects the traveler because there's 100, we fly 140 million people a year. Uh, if you screw something up, it's pretty apparent pretty quickly, right? And people are really unhappy. So you also have to be very careful. At the same time, safety is always job one. You can never afford to take any chance with safety. And the levels of investment and focus and attention and safety are always critical. So it's a, you know, it's a tough business but it's also a business that has reformed itself through consolidation and I believe is providing enormous value uh, to the economy and to customers and will continue to do so for, for, for decades to come. I'm going to make a vow. If not on stage at Aspen, maybe on air, air, but I want to bring you back in a year and see where this survey is and, sure. and talk Happy to you to about it. where the, you the numbers have gone. Happy to um, Let me open the floor to, to questions if you have them for Jeff. Yeah, yes, sir. Let's right here. I think we have a, we have a microphone have a mic coming. coming. I think, yeah. This is what I've learned about Aspen. The hardest job is running these microphones. I mean, you, you all should. Yeah, get Jeff, realizing you're in the business, that you're as good as your last flight, and it's easy as customers to criticize. Sure. I've seen United in particular with the reinvestment in equipment, but uh, mostly interested in the 787. Has the 78 met your expectations now that you've been operating it? for some time and what deficiencies are there or has it exceeded what you had hoped for? Sure, um, yes and no, I think is the right answer to that question. The 787 is a magnificent uh, aircraft with cutting edge technology. It, it has th about 30% more range than the similar size 767, for example, and it operates with about 20% more fuel efficiency. 
It is also a very quiet airplane. It has high humidity because of the carbon fiber shell, which permits, which, 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 uh, permits the aircraft to be pressurized to a lower altitude. So the combination of lower pressure inside of the cabin and humidity on a long haul mission, which it's designed to do, makes you feel much more refreshed uh, from your travel. So it's a superb piece of technology, and I think the Boeing company, I love my friends at Airbus too, we operate 152 Airbus airplanes, um, but, but I think the Boeing, the Boeing people, the Boeing engineers are among the, among the best in the world, and they've produced a spectacular uh, uh, product. That said, it's dispatch reliability, that is, think of it like your car, you go to your car, you open the door, you put your key in, you turn the key or you push the button, and it starts, right? That's what you want in your car. That's called dispatch reliability. Uh, that's lower than we had anticipated. Um, but we have worked closely with Boeing to improve it. It is not at the level it should be, and Boeing knows it. Uh, they're very supportive of us and the other operators of the Dreamliner. Um, we'll get there. A lot of it, a lot of the, um, a lot of the problems are what are called nuisance faults. That is the, because this is a, a, a very technologically advanced airplane. Uh, the onboard uh, systems spit out uh, errors, in effect, nuisance errors. Now, you can't ignore them because we're a safety-oriented airline. So even if it's wrong, and even if you believe it's wrong, you have to check out every single one of those or the airplane doesn't take off because we take zero risk with safety. And that's been a problem. Uh, Boeing has cut down the number of nuisance uh, faults uh, materially, but we are not where we need to be yet on that airplane. Boeing knows it. We know it. Everybody in the industry knows it. Uh, but I believe the airplane will be a highly successful product for Boeing. I, I can't remember the number of orders, but it's vast. Uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, we'll have a total of 55 of those airplanes, and we're, we're a big believer in the airplane. Um, uh, and certainly, um, uh, when the airplane's up and flying, is, and most of the time it certainly is, uh, our customers love it. That airplane has the highest customer satisfaction ranking of any of our product. Let me go to the back, uh, right here. Hi, my name is Dick Palin. Um, you mentioned customer service improvements and they're terrific and good, good luck with them. But I would say that some of the problems in the industry from a customer's perspective don't apply only to United, they apply to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for a consumer service industry, the airlines are close to the bottom in consumer <coughs> satisfaction. And among the reasons that you didn't address are smaller and smaller seats, nickel and diming for more and more things, trying to dream up ways uh, to make consumers less happy, but more, the airline more profitable. That's one area. The other area is survey after survey has shown that after merger, airline, uh, cities that have uh, more, uh, 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 fewer airlines and uh, more, less competition have much higher fares uh, than the airlines, than the cities that have uh, more competition, and could you address that in terms of mergers? Thank you. Sure. Um, well, let, let me talk about seats first. Um, we actually haven't reduced the size of the seats. What has happened is Americans um, have grown somewhat wider over time, uh, and that is actually a fact, and we have the data that shows, unfortunately, we shows both. Um, uh, now, it is true that we have put what are called slimline seats on a number of our airplanes. That's a new technology that didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago. And that is a lighter weight seat. And of course, every pound matters when you fly because pounds burn fuel, which, which is expensive for us and, and damages the environment. Um, so we put slimline seats on board the aircraft. Uh, and because of the design of the slimline seat and the, and the way that it, it, it's, it's cut out, um, you can actually add, in some cases, a row of seats, and you're not and you're not you're not degrading the the legroom of the customers, and that's a, a huge value to us because we can add marginal additional passengers with a, with a fixed cost, roughly a fixed cost, the fuel burn of the passenger in the bags, but roughly a fixed cost. Uh, so I think that's been very valuable. Um, in terms of of the the impact of mergers on communities. Um, I, I would say that I don't think that uh, the, 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 there's uh, some degree of dispute in terms of, in terms of the price impact of mergers. Um, this remains a quite a, quite a competitive business. Uh, if we are, some people say, well, gee, in the United States has become an oligopoly. Let me tell you, if we are oligopolists, we are the most stupid human beings on the planet because we do not have oligopolistic rents, not even close to them. Uh, our, our margins are, are, are poor compared to just a standard industrial company. And we're, we aspire to be a company. Our first aspiration is to become a business. 
We used to be an airline, which was not a business. Our, we aspire to become a business, and I think we're on the way to becoming a business. What do you mean by that when you say that? Means, that means some, a, a, a business is an enterprise that can earn its cost of capital. And if you go out and borrow money at, at 7% and invest it at 3%, yeah, you, that's irrational. That's what, the, that's what the airlines used to do, right? So we aspire to just be a normal business with normal returns, and then someday to be an industrial with industrial level returns. Um, and I don't think anybody would claim that an industrial company uh, is, is uh, you know, has, has aberrant pricing or, or non-competitive uh, pricing. Um, this remains a, a, a remarkably competitive business in the United States. Not only are they the large carriers, but you know the, do you know the largest carrier in the United States, the largest domestic airline? Southwest. Southwest is larger than United or Delta or American. By what measure? In, domestic, what is in terms of its capacity in the United States. Um, we also have carriers, uh, low-cost carriers like Spirit or Frontier. We also have carriers like JetBlue. We have carriers like Virgin America. There's a lot of price discipline in this business, and let me assure you, if we were charging above market pricing anywhere, since this is, and since most all airports are wide open for competition, people can come in. Now, there are some slot-controlled airports. There are very few of them left in the United States. Uh, but again, the Justice Department does a very good job of making sure that low-cost airlines continue to have slots so they can exercise price discipline on, on, on larger carriers. So I don't actually subscribe to the theory that mergers have raised prices and we have you know, oligopolistic rents in the airline business, because all you have to do is look at our margins to prove that's not true, and all you have to do is examine the structure and conduct of the business as an, as an economist would to see it's not true. We'll have to leave it there, sadly. We're out of time. Jeff, thank you for, for uh, sharing a stage with pleasure. me. It's my pleasure. Thanks for honor. having me. Thanks, Len. Thank you all for your interest. <laughs>